okay? Uh, let's jump to the New Testament. Uh, just one second. Let's jump to the New Testament, the book of Romans, uh, chapter 14, verse 1. Okay. Read that. We're in the book of Romans in the New Testament, chapter 14, verse 1. Okay, and this is this is one of the scriptures that Christians use in order to uh, justify the eating of unclean food or unclean creatures, I should, should say. Okay, just one second. Uh, just one second. Okay, we should be good now. Okay. So this is the book of Romans, chapter 14, verse 1. And once again, this is one of the scriptures that Christians use in order to justify the eating of unclean creatures. And I say creatures. Why? Because these particular, or the uh, things we read in the book of Leviticus, the 11th chapter, when you read them, it states that they are abominations and that they are unclean, okay? Nowhere does it state that these creatures should be used for food, for meat, or for nourishment, okay? So we're going to read in Romans, the 14th chapter, okay? Go ahead. Romans 14 and 1. Him that is weak in the faith receive you. Hold on. For some reason, they have the, the, the audio playing in the back. I don't know how this is happening. Somehow they have the thing playing in the back. I'm not sure how this how this is happening. Just, just one second. Let me figure this out. Okay, we're going to try it now to see if it works. Okay, Romans 14 and 1, read. Romans 14 and 1. Him that is weak in the faith receive you, but not to doubtful disputations. So it says, him that is weak in the faith receive ye. Okay. So this is talking about an individual that is weak in the faith. The question is, why is he or she weak in the faith? We're going to show you as we read on. Go ahead. Verse 2. For one believeth that he may eat all things. It says, for one believeth that he may eat all things. Now Christians will stop at this verse and they will magnify the fact that it states, one believeth that he may eat all things things. But the question is, what does it mean when it says all things? Because if you're saying all things, that can include uh, roaches, that can, that can include rats, that can include snakes, that can include possum, that can include swine, the things that the Most High stated to stay away from. That, that can even include humans or people. Okay? And you may have a Christian who say, well, it's common sense that you're not supposed to eat those particular things. But the question is, is it really common sense? 
okay? Is it really common sense? Or do you just use these particular scriptures to justify the things that you want to eat, such as pork, shrimp, crab, lobster, catfish, so on and so forth? Okay? Now we're going to show you what, it's, what it means when it says, He believeth, one believeth that he may eat all things. But first, let's go back to the book of Genesis, chapter 9, verse 3. We're going to show you the correct context of the scripture. Uh, Genesis chapter 9, verse 3. Go ahead. Genesis 9 and 3. Every moving thing that liveth shall be for me, for you, for, excuse me. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Read that again. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. So that sounds very similar to Romans, the 14th chapter in the second verse, where it says, stay there, uh, Genesis 9. That's, that sounds very similar to Romans 14 and 2, where it states that one believeth that he may eat all things. Read that again. Verse 3. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. So in the book of Genesis it says, every moving thing that live shall be meat for you. Now does that every moving thing include, uh, include ro uh, ratchet, excuse me, uh, roaches and rats, uh, possums and snakes and spiders and all those different uh, creatures? Let's see. Go ahead. Even as the green herb have I given you all things. It says, even as the green herb have I given you all things. We know that in Genesis, the first chapter, it says that the green herb shall be used for meat, which means for food or consumption. Okay. But the question is, did Noah eat every single moving thing that moved upon the face of the earth? Or was there a stipulation? Okay. Was there a line in the sand when it came to the moving creatures that Noah ate? Let's see. Let's go back to Genesis, the seventh chapter. Genesis 7, started verse 2. Genesis 7 and 2. Of every clean beast, thou shalt take to thee by sevens. So as you can see, there was a stipulation, or there was a line drawn in the sand when it came to the beast, or the moving creatures that Noah could eat. As you can see in the, the uh, seventh chapter in the book of Genesis, the Most High commanded Noah to take clean beasts, okay, a certain number of clean beasts. And as we read earlier, he commanded him to take a certain number of unclean beasts. Okay? So when it says every moving thing shall be used for consumption as the green herb or shall be eaten as the green herb, it's not talking about every single moving creature under the sun. Okay? It's talking about those moving creatures that were separated for the purpose of eating. The clean beast that the Most High told Noah to take seven of back in Genesis, the seventh chapter. Okay, so let's go back to Romans, the 14th chapter. Read that, Romans 14 and 2. Romans 14 and 2. For one believeth that he may eat all things. So one believeth he may eat all things. Out of what? out of all the clean things in which the Most High separated for the purpose of eating. This cannot be talking about swine because the Most High never separated swine for the purpose of eating. This cannot be talking about catfish because the Most High never separated catfish for the purpose of eating. It cannot be talking about lobsters, shrimps, and uh, clams and all those different things because they were never, never separated for the purpose of eating. Okay? And in order to understand this, you must go back to Leviticus, the 11th chapter. Okay? How can something be eaten when the Most High says you're not even supposed to touch the carcass of it? And that it's an abomination, that it's unclean. Okay? So let's get the proper context of what this chapter is talking about. Go ahead. Another who is weak eateth herbs. It says, another who is weak eateth herbs. So this is talking about the person who is weak in the faith. When you go into the Greek and you look up that herbs, it's tran it, it translates into vegetable. Okay? So on one side of the spectrum, you had people who believed that they can eat all things which were sanctified and separated as clean by the Most High's dietary law. Then you had others 
who decided that to be safe, to be on the safe side, we're going to show you what we mean by that when we say on the safe side, they decided not to eat uh, the meats, even those that were separated and sanctified by the dietary law, by the Most High. And there was a reason for it. So you got meat eaters and you got vegetarians, okay? And this is what the scripture is talking about. It's not talking about a person who believes he can eat unclean foods or eat anything he wants. And on the other hand, you got a person who eat herbs, okay, or vegetables. Go ahead. Verse 3. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. So it says, let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. So this is talking about he that eateth all things. Let he that eateth all things despise, uh, let him not despise him that eateth not all things. Okay, once again, Christians will use this in order to say that you can't despise me if I decide to eat all things, including the swine, including the shrimp, including the uh, catfish, including the lobster, and including the oyst oysters and the mussels and all the unclean things with the most high set to stay away from. Okay, so verse 3, once again, it says, Let him that eateth despise him that eateth not. Or let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. Go ahead. And let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth. And let not him which eateth not, speaking about the one that eateth not all things, the one who strictly deals with vegetables, deals with herbs. It says, let him judge, let him not judge him that eateth which means he can't judge the person who eats meat. Okay, go ahead. For the Most High have received him. For the Most High have received him. So the Most High have received both he who eateth the meats, which the Most High have sanctified as clean, and he who decides to stay away from the meat and eat vegetables. Now, once again, there was a purpose for the vegetarian to stay away from the meat. We're going to show you. Go ahead. Verse 4. Who art thou that judges another man's servant? To his own master, he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be uh, holding up. For the Most High is able to make him stand. Let's jump down to verse 6. Let's get right into it. Verse 6. Romans 14 and 6. He that regardeth a day, regardeth it unto the Most High. And he that regardeth not the day, to the Most High he doeth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Most High. So it says, he that eateth, eateth to the Most High, or eateth to the Lord. This is another part of this chapter that's, that Christians use to justify the eating of unclean creatures. Go ahead. For he giveth the Most High thanks. It says, for he giveth the Most High thanks. Go ahead. So they say, well, if I'm eating pig feet, or if I'm eating chitlins, or if I'm eating pork bacon, I'm eating it unto the Most High, or I'm eating it unto the Lord. Okay, and that it's okay as long as I give the most high thanks. Well, let's see if this is what this particular chapter or this particular verse is talking about. Go ahead. And he that eateth not, to the most high, uh, he eateth not. So they'll use this to say, well, if you decide not to eat pork, then that's okay too because you eat unto the Lord. And it's okay as long as you give the Lord thanks. Go ahead. But let's see if this is what it's talking about. Go ahead. And give thanks to the Most High. Verse 7. And none of us liveth to himself. And no man dieth to himself. For what, so what, for whether we live, and we will live unto the Most High. And whether we die, we die unto the Most High. Whether we live, therefore, thereof, or die, we are the Most High. So whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. Okay, we are separated unto the Lord whether we live or die okay that's what the scripture is talking about but the question is how can you live unto the Lord if you consume the, the same things that the Most High deemed abominable and the same things the Most High commanded you to stay away from okay that should be the question now going back to the verse prior once again this is dealing with the subject of meat eaters and vegetarians okay he that eateth meat that was sanctified and clean by the Most High, he eateth unto the Lord. And it's okay because he giveth the Most High thanks. He that eateth the herbs, he that eateth the vegetables, he that eateth the fruit of the earth, it's okay whether he eat, whether, excuse me, it's okay because he eateth it unto the Lord. 
okay? And he gives it, when he goes to eat it, he prays over it. And he giveth thanks to the Most High that the Most High have provided him with his meal. Okay? That's all it's talking about. Okay, go ahead. Verse 9. Verse 9. For to this end, Christ both died and rose and received that he might be the Most High, be Lord, both of the dead and living. Let's jump down to verse 13. Let's get straight to the key points of this chapter. Verse 13. Verse 13, let us not therefore judge one another anymore. So a Christian will state, well, you, let's, let us not judge another anymore. Okay, go ahead. But judge this rapper, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. So what is it talking about when it speaks about the stumbling block? Okay, putting a stumbling block before your brother. Okay. In order to understand this, you must jump to the book of First Corinthians, the tenth chapter, because this same exact argument was present within the church of Corinthians. Okay, First Corinthians chapter ten. We're going to start at verse. Let's see. Let's start at verse twenty. First Corinthians ten and twenty. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice. They sacrifice the devil. So it says the things with which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice unto devils, idols, gods, demons. Go ahead. And not to the Most High. And they don't sacrifice it unto the Most High. So that, Now this begins to unveil exactly what Romans the 14th chapter is talking about. Okay. And this actually opens up some understanding as to why you at... This opens up the understanding as to why you had some who were weak in the faith. Okay, go ahead. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Verse 21. You cannot drink the cup of the Most High and the cup of devils. You can't drink the cup of the Most High and the cup of devils. Go ahead. You cannot be partakers of the Most High's table and of the table of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Most High's table and the table of devils okay now keep in mind the uh keep in mind the subject matter of this particular chapter and verse is talking about things that are sacrificed unto idols go ahead verse 22 do we provoke the most side to jealousy are we stronger than he all things are lawful for me so paul says all things are lawful unto him okay and of course, this is talking about things that are actually contained within the law. Okay? It can't be talking about pork, shrimp, crab, or lobster, or anything other than what the Most High sanctified as clean, as righteous, as holy. Okay? It can't be talking about those things because the law condemns those things. Okay? So when he says, all things are lawful unto me, this is talking about things that are actually contained in the law. Go ahead. But all things are not expedient. But all things are not expedient. What is Paul talking about? It's going to show you. Go ahead. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. So even though, even though all things are lawful, all things edify not. Okay. An example. We know that according to scripture, wine is legal. Okay. Drinking wine is lawful according to scripture. Okay. But yet... If you have a brother or sister who is weak in the faith or a brother or sister who, when you drink wine in front of them, it puts a stumbling, stumbling block before them, now that particular thing becomes sin unto that particular person or you actually put a stumbling block before that person. That's what it means that all things are lawful. That wine may be lawful, but it doesn't necessarily edify in every situation. Okay, so you have to be careful, like we read in Romans 14, not to put a stumbling block before your brother, whether it be with your wine or with your meat. Okay, go ahead. Verse 24, let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. So let a man not seek his own, which means let a man not seek only the, the, uh, the things that please him, but let him also seek another man's wealth, which, all, which are the things that are also good for another individual. Okay, those things which actually edify and better your brother instead of always worrying about the things that benefit and the things that satis satisfy yourself. Okay, go ahead. Verse 25, 
whatsoever is sold in the shambles that eat. It says, so whatsoever is sh sold in the shambles, meaning the markets that eat. Okay, when you look up shambles, it states that this is talking about markets. So whatsoever is sold in your market, it says that eat. Go ahead. Asking no question for conscience sake. Asking no questions for conscience sake. Go ahead. Verse 26. For the earth is the most size and the fullness thereof. So it says the earth is the, is the most size and the fullness thereof. Now why does it state that uh, whatsoever is sold, that eat? Asking no questions for conscience sake. Because you may have had some uh, foods that were in the shambles, that were sold in the shambles, that was actually sacrificed unto idols and deities. The same way when you go to the market today, you may have chicken or you may have fish or you may have uh, some type of beef or something that was, that's a clean animal but was actually sacrificed unto an idol, making it unclean, okay? But you really have absolutely no uh, way of identifying whether it was sacrificed to an idol or not. So the Bible says those things eat, asking no questions for conscience sake, okay? Now this gives us some understanding as to why, going back to Romans the 14th chapter, you had those who only ate vegetables, those who were weak in the faith, okay? They were trying to, they were trying to abstain from the meats which were sacrificed to idols, okay? And it became so corrupt because during this time we were under the rulership of the Romans and they were known for sac sacrificing unto the idols. Okay? And you had our people who were following the customs of the Romans who sacrificed their food unto idols. Okay? So you have brothers and sisters who were like, listen, I'm, 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 trying to, I'm trying my best to abstain from this, but there's no way for me to identify whether this was sacrificed to an idol or not. I'd rather not deal with meat at all and become a vegetarian, okay? So this is where the argument arose between those who ate the herbs, the vegetables, and those who ate meat, okay? Go ahead. Verse 27, if any of them that believeth not bid you to a feast, and ye be dispossessed to go, and you be disposed to go, sorry, whatsoever is set before you eat, it says, so whatsoever is set before you eat, go ahead. Asking no question for conscience sake. Asking no questions for conscience sake. Okay. Now, is this talking about if something is pork, shrimp, crab, or lobster? Absolutely not. Okay. This is dealing with the context of something that has been sacrificed to an idol. Okay. So if you don't know if it's been sacrificed to an idol or not, it says eat. Don't ask any questions for conscience sake. Go ahead. Verse 28. But if any man say unto you. But now if you have a brother or a sister who is present at the feast, who has prior knowledge that this particular animal or this particular beast was sacrificed unto an idol, and they say unto you, go ahead. This is offered and sacrificed unto idols. This is offered and sacrificed unto idols. No, this is talking about swan. This is offered and sacrificed unto idols. No, it has shrimp in it. This is offered and sacrificed unto idols. No, it has clams in it or oysters in it. This is offered and sacrificed unto idols. This is strictly dealing with the concept or context of something that has been sacrificed unto idols. Okay. Read on. Eat not for his sake. That it says, eat not for the sake of the person who showed you. Okay. Why? Because even though you may be eating something clean, such as lamb, such as sheep, such as goat, such as ox, such as beef, even though it may be clean, to that person it's unclean. Why? Because it's been sacrificed unto an idol. Go ahead. And for conscience sake, the earth is the most eyes and the foreign is thereof. It says, and for conscience sake, why? Because the earth is the Lord's and the what? And the foreign is thereof. And the foreign is thereof. Okay, go ahead. Verse 29. Conscience, I say, I say not thine own. So it says, conscience, I say not thine own. So even though it may not pierce your conscience that has been sacrificed to an idol, okay, even though it may not trouble your conscience, go ahead. But of the others. But of the other. It may pierce or it may trouble the conscience of your brother. So for his sake, you abstain from the meat that's been sacrificed unto an idol. Go ahead. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? 
So now the question is asked, why is my liberty, my liberty that I have in Christ, why is it judged of, the, of another man's conscience? Okay, how can another man's conscience determine the liberty and the freedom and the grace that I have in Christ? Go ahead. Verse 30, for if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of? So if I'm a, if I'm a partaker of grace, how can I be evil spoken of? How is this possible? Go ahead. For that, for which I give thanks. Verse 31, whether thereof, whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of the Most High. So whatsoever you do, whether it be eat or drink, you must do it unto the glory of the Father, of the Most High. Okay, go ahead. Verse 32, give none offense, neither to the Jews nor to the Gentiles nor to the church of the Most High. So what does it mean when it says you may give, you have to give glory unto the Most High? This is showing you that when you eat, whether you eat or you drink, you cannot give any offense to your brother or your sister. Like the example I gave earlier with the wine. If you have a brother or sister who is troubled or their, their conscience is pierced when they see people drinking wine, then you have to be careful when you drink around them. Okay? Same, same way when you eat certain things that may be lawful according to scripture, okay? If they have knowledge that this particular beast or this animal has been sacrificed unto an idol, this thing becomes a stumbling block unto them, okay? So now let's go back to Romans, the 14th chapter, because believe it or not, this is the context, the full context of Romans, the 14th chapter, okay? He that eateth all things is talking about he that ate things that were clean and sanctified by the Most High, Okay, yet there was a possibility that that clean beast or that clean animal was sac sacrificed unto an idol. Okay, and you had the other brother or sister who was weak in the faith who decided to abstain from the meat and to eat vegetables. And anyone they seen eating meat, they would try to condemn and judge. Okay, why? Because they would say, well, it's a possibility that that food or that beast could have been sacrificed unto an idol. Why are you still eating meat? Okay, and then the argument will go back and forth. Okay, let's go back to Romans, the 14th chapter, to show it. Let's go back to verse 13. Romans 14 and 13. Let us not therefore judge one another uh, anymore, but judge this rather, that no, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. So don't put a stumbling block before your brother. What is the stumbling block in this instance? The fact that the beast or the food that you're eating could have been sacrificed to an idol. And that could have put a stumbling block and troubled the conscience of your brother or your sister. Go ahead. Verse 14. I know and am persuaded by the, by the Lord Yeshua that there is none, that there is no, nothing, that it is nothing unclean of itself. So it says, I am persuaded of the Lord Yeshua that there is, there is nothing unclean of itself. Okay? Now, once again, this is one of the Christian's favorite scriptures because it states that there is nothing unclean clean of itself. So then they'll go in their whole rant and state, well, swine is not unclean of itself, or pork is not unclean of itself, or uh, shrimps are not unclean of, of, of themselves, or crabs are not unclean of themselves, or lobsters are not unclean of themselves. Okay? But the question is, how can this be so when the Bible tells you in the book of Leviticus that these things are unclean unto you, that they are an abomination, okay? These particular animals are naturally clean. Why? Because they were used for the purpose of cleaning the earth, cleaning up the waste of the earth and cleaning up the waste of the sea, okay? So these animals are unclean of themselves, okay? So what does it mean when it says nothing is unclean of itself? Once again, this is talking about clean animals that may have been sacrificed unto an idol, okay? Now that animal naturally is not unclean. A sheep is not naturally unclean. A goat is not naturally unclean, okay? Turtle doves are not naturally unclean, okay? A chicken is not naturally unclean, okay? They become unclean when they are sacrificed unto an idol. That's what it means when it states that nothing is unclean of itself. Go ahead. But to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, 
to him it is unclean. But to any man that esteemeth anything to be unclean, it is unclean unto him. Which means that even though you may have yourself uh, some curry goat or whatever you may have you curry lamb or whatever you, you, may, you may like to eat. If you're eating it in front of a person who deems it unclean ba on the basis that it might have been sacrificed into an idol, then that food becomes unclean unto him. The same way swine is unclean unto him. The same way uh, uh, lobsters un are unclean unto him. Okay, go ahead. Verse 15. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitable. Destroy not him with thy meat, for whom Christ died. So it says, if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not char charitably, okay, or charitably, okay? Now the question is, why would your brother be grieved with your meat? As we read earlier in the book of 1 Corinthians, this is strictly beca because this meat was sacrificed unto an idol. Okay, this has nothing to do with unclean and clean according to the book of Leviticus. Okay, pork is out of the picture. Pig feet is out of the picture. Chitlins are out of the picture. Bacon is out of the picture. Okay, shrimp scampi is out of the picture. Okay, lobster, surf and turf, that's out of the picture. Okay, uh, oyster, what do they call it? Uh, clam chowder, that's out of the picture. Okay, it has nothing to do with any of those particular, what they call in this earth, delicacies. Okay, go ahead. Verse 16, let not then your good be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of the Most High is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Exactly, so the Most High's kingdom is not about meat and drink. Okay, it's about righteousness. Okay, so now let's go back to the book of Genesis and let us get the definition of meat. Okay, let's, let us get the definition of meat and this will probably be the last thing before we, we shut down. Okay, and, and moving into the next segment. Okay. Let's go back to Genesis, the first chapter. Okay. Going back to Genesis, the first chapter, and the 29th verse. We're going to get the definition of the word meat. Okay? Read that verse again. Uh, the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verse 29. Read that. Genesis 1 and 29. And the most I said, Behold, I have, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of the of all the earth and every and every tree and and the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed to you it shall be for meat so it says to you it shall be for meat the question is what is meat okay here we have the definition out of the strong's concordance for meat and it's hebrew word h402 and i'm going to see if i can put it in the chat Okay, just one second, I have to log into the chat. So what is the definition of meat? Okay. When you go to the Hebrew, once again, it's H402, a color. Okay, a color, which means food, consume, devour, eat, food, or meat. Now, here's a question for you all, and I want, if the chat is closed, I want the chat to be in pause briefly so that you all can answer this question. Okay? Can lobsters be considered as meat? Okay. I want to ask you all. Can lobsters be considered as meat? Okay.
Okay, yes or no? Can lobsters be considered meat? Okay, someone says la ah. The question is why not? Why can't lobsters be considered meat? Okay, we have la ah, we have no. Okay, good. The question is why? Someone says, some people eat llama. No, llama is not to be consumed as food. Okay, it's part of the camel family. Okay, someone says, it's not a clean food according to the law. Close, but no cigar. Someone says, they are scavengers. Someone says, because they are unclean. 100% correct. Okay. Now, the reason, I, the reason why, why I said that uh, the answer when it says they are unclean food is because they are not food at all, okay? Pig is not food. Lobster is not food. Shrimp is not food, okay? Oysters are not food. Why? Because they were never separated for the purpose of being, of being eaten or consumed according to the Most High's dietary law. Okay, so when you label it with the name food, you're giving it a label in which this is something that can be consumed or eaten. Okay, but we know that according to Leviticus, the 11th chapter, all of these particular creatures and beasts were abominable. They were not to be touched. Okay, so there's no possible way that they can be food or meat. Okay, exactly, because the purpose was was to clean waste. The purpose was not to eat these particular creatures. Okay? Someone says goat. Goat is actually a clean animal. Okay? Goat is clean. As a matter of fact, when you go to the book of Exodus, the 12th chapter, on the Passover, if you, if you weren't able to get a lamb, then you were able to use a goat. Okay? Someone says, can we explain Proverbs 20 or 1 about wine? Okay. Deer is also clean. Okay. Deer can be eating, uh, eaten or consumed. Okay. It tells you that in the Bible. Okay. When he speaks about the roe, the deer. Okay. These things can be eaten. Okay. Uh, real quick, this is going to be one question because we have to switch over to uh, Elder Rikosh Yar because he has something that he wants to go into uh, concerning the oil spill, okay? Uh, chitlins uh, are actually pig intestines, okay? They, they are the intestines of a pig, of a pig, excuse me. Okay, someone says Proverbs, what, 20 and 1? It says, wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Okay, so that's talking about drinking wine and over excess. Okay, to prove that, let's go to the Apocrypha uh, real quick. Let's go to the Apocrypha real quick to prove to you that wine is actually good as long as it's uh, consumed in moderation. Okay, let's go to Ecclesiasticus, uh, the 31st chapter. And this will be the only question before we, um, before we switch over. Okay. Uh, Ecclesiasticus chapter 32, verse 27. Okay. As a matter of fact, let's start at verse 25. Ecclesiastes 31 and 25. Show not thou, show not violentness in wine. So it says, show not thy violentness in wine. Meaning that don't uh, try to become violent and tough after you drink wine or drink alcohol. Okay, and you notice this a lot. When people, after they get drunk, 
after they have a few drinks, they now become the toughest man on earth. Okay? When a few minutes ago, before they consumed the drinks, they were, they were like church mouse or, or church mice. Okay? So it says, show not thy valiantness in wine. Go ahead. For wine have destroyed many. For wine have destroyed many, like we read in the book of Proverbs 20 and 1. Go ahead. Verse 26. The furnace proved the edge by dipping. So do of wine the hearts of the proud by drunkenness. So it says, the furnace proveth that by the edge of dipping, uh, so do of wine the hearts of the proud by drunkenness. So the Bible condemns the act of drunkenness. Okay? Now let's jump. Yeah, let's go to verse 27. Go ahead. Verse 27. Wine is, a good, wine is as good as life to a man. So it says, wine is as good as life to a man. So wine is good for a man. Go ahead. If it be drunk in moderate. But the key is if it be drunk moderately. Okay. The key is if it's been drunk moderately. Okay. Go ahead. What life is then to a man that is without wine? So the Bible says, what is life to a man with no wine? <laughs> Can you imagine a life without wine? Okay. That's what the scriptures is asking. Go ahead. For it was made to make men glad. It was created to make men glad, okay, to make men happy. Now, as you go on, it uh, speaks about wine being measurably drunk, okay? And then it goes into what wine can do when it's drunk and over access. Okay, just to clear that up. All right. Uh, so now we're going to, uh, someone says wild fish and cod is good. But should we be concerned with radiation? Well, yes, that, that does play a factor. Like we just read in the scripture, and I seen earlier someone says that tilapia is, is, is uh, fed pigs when it's form grown, okay? And once again, as I mentioned earlier, as we read in the book of uh, Romans, the 14th chapter, nothing is unclean of itself, okay? Like fish and salmon and cod, those are actually clean fish. They're not unclean of itself. But it, it, it becomes unclean when... when uh, they start forming it and feeding it certain things, and when they start poisoning the waters and radiating the fish, that's when it, that's when it becomes unclean. So we still must be careful even when we, when we consume uh, clean animals and clean creatures because they, you know, so many things are being done uh, to these creatures. Okay. Yes, that is true. Red wine is good for the blood. Okay. Now let's let's um, switch over to uh, Elder Rakashiar once again. He has a uh, he has some information, some key information he wanted to touch on based on the uh, oil spill, okay, that happened a while back in the, in the United States, and how that's still affecting us up until this day, okay. So with that, I want to say bless you all and shalom. I pray you all received uh, some understanding based on this, and hopefully. Uh, you brothers and sisters, especially you who are learning and uh, growing up in the truth, uh, will not allow the Christians uh, to continue to confuse you when it comes to these particular chapters in, in the New Testament. Okay? The New Testament, once again, does not justify the eating of unclean uh, creatures. Okay? So with that, I want to say bless you all and shalom. Okay? Since this is the Sabbath, we want to start off by saying, uh, bless you all, Shabbat Shalom, which means in the name of the Most High in Christ, bless you all. Uh, before we get into it, uh, once again, since this is the Sabbath, as we do every Sabbath before we start uh, reading out of the law or before we start any lesson, uh, we make sure we give the most high is due with the prayer of Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4 uh, also known as the Shema okay so we're going to do the prayer and we're going to go straight into the the lesson uh, about halfway through uh, the lesson we're going to switch over and Elder Ricard Shiar is going to pick up uh, where we uh, left off he's going to go into a, a bit of information uh, of what's going on with the oil spill in the United States Okay. 
Shemaya Sha'ala Ahaya Alahayanawa Ahaya Achad. Shemaya Sha'ala Ahaya Alahayanawa Ahaya Achad. Shemaya Sha'ala Ahaya Alahayanawa Ahaya Achad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Okay. Once again, that's the prayer of Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Okay. Now, today, since uh, we usually go into the law for every Sabbath, I thought that we would go into a lesson that pertains to the law, but we will, uh, this law will extend outside of the Old Testament. Okay, and the lesson I wanted to cover was, is a lesson that I covered quite a few times. Okay, and this is based on the dietary law and the, the existence of the dietary law in the New Testament. Okay, and the reason I wanted to cover this is because a lot of you brothers and sisters deal with Christians who either believe or teach uh, that the New Testament marks the ending of the Old Testament laws and covenant and that also one of those laws that were done away with in the New Testament is the dietary law which was one of the major laws and customs of the Hebrew people the Israelite people so we're going to go into the Old Testament first in the book of Leviticus okay you're going to start in the book of Leviticus to read the custom of the dietary law. And as a matter of fact, before we go to the book of Leviticus, let's go a, a bit before the book of Leviticus and let's go to the book of Genesis. Okay, let's go to the book of Genesis, uh, the first chapter. Okay, because one thing you'll hear Christians say is that the uh, dietary law began with the law of Moses or what they call in the uh, theologian seminary college the Mosaic law okay but we're going to show according to the Bible that long before Moses came on the scene there was an existence or some semblance of a dietary law okay the Hebrews had well before the Hebrews uh, going all, all the way back to the creation of the universe, you had some semblance of a dietary law that was given by the Heavenly Father. And what we're going to do is we're going to read these scriptures. We're going to just read through them. And then a bit later, we're going to come back to them to get uh, some understanding on these particular scriptures. And I want you to remember these scriptures because it's going to fare very well. Or it's going to be very important to remember these scriptures uh, as we go into the New Testament. Okay. So let's start in the book of Genesis, the first chapter, and let's start around the 32nd verse. Well, let's, let's start up at verse 30. Genesis 1 and 30. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to every thing that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. Read that again. Verse 30. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the earth. Start at verse 29. We're going to start in the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verse 29. Okay, to show you that in the beginning, uh, the Most High had a commandment on what was supposed to be food or meat for both people and animals. Okay, for both the people and the beast of the field that he created on the sixth day okay Genesis chapter 1 verse 29 Genesis 1 and 29 and the most High said behold I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree and the which is the fruit of a tree you can see to you it shall be for me to you it shall be for what for me so it says to you it shall be for me speaking about the man and woman that he created on the sixth day of creation. Okay, so he says it shall be to you for meat. Speaking about the herb yielding seed and the fruit 
okay now notice that in the book of Genesis fruit is being referred to as meat okay we're going to get the understanding on that a bit later and we're actually going to get the definition of meat because you're going to find out that the uh, term meat has been misconstrued the definition the true understanding of what meat is has been misconstrued through Christian theology okay so whenever you read in the New Testament about uh, someone not being able to judge you in meat or you know someone uh, consuming meat and you're not able to uh, condemn them for eating certain types of meat they make you believe that it's talking about uh, things such as pork, shrimp, crab, lobster, any, anything that they deem or that the Bible deems abominable. Okay? We're going to find out that that's not true. Go ahead. Verse 30. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat. So even the animals at this point, of the, at this point in history uh, the beast of the field, uh, the fowls of the air, and the insects consumed the same uh, herbs, okay? Or they ate from the same herb yielding seed that the Most High created for man, okay? So at this time, all of the Most High's creation, including the beast of the field, were what they would call today herbivores, okay? Herb herbivores or fruitarians. They only ate uh, herbs, vegetation, and fruit. Okay, but of course that changed after the fall of Adam. Let's go to the book of Genesis, the seventh chapter. Let's go to Genesis chapter seven, uh, verse two, and this is during the time of Noah. Keep in mind that this is long before the time of Moses. This is before Leviticus, the 11th chapter. This is before Deuteronomy. You also have the dietary law written in Deuteronomy, the 14th chapter. This is before all of those scriptures which contain the dietary law. Okay? Or what Christian scholars uh, claim to be the Mosaic law. Okay? Go ahead. Genesis 7 and 2. Of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens. The male and his female. Read that again. Of every clean beast. Thou uh, of every what? Of every clean beast. So it states of every clean beast. Okay, making a separation between clean and unclean. Go ahead. Thou shalt take to thee by sevens. Thou shalt take to thee by sevens. So every clean beast was to be taken by sevens. Why? Because the clean beasts were consumed and used for food. Okay. So if Noah decided to eat, if he decided to take himself a sheep or a lamb or a goat to eat it, he would have more uh, goat that would be able to reprocreate and make more goats or make more lambs or make more sheep. Okay? But let's see how many unclean beasts Noah was commanded to, uh, to take. Go ahead. The male and, if, and his female and of beasts that are not uh, clean by twos and it says beasts that are not clean once again showing you that there was a difference made between clean and unclean it says of the the beasts that are not clean you shall take what by two by twos okay why because these beasts were not used for consumption they were not used to be eaten okay so let's say for instance uh, Noah decided you got one male pig and one female pig now, if Noah decided to eat the male pig or the female pig, there would not be the, uh, the opposite sex would not be available in order to that particular, for that particular creature to continue to reprocreate. Okay? If he ate the male pig, then you would only have a female pig. She would not be able to make more baby pigs on her own. The same thing if he would have ate the female pig. The male pig would not be able to reprocreate more pigs so that that creation can continue to live on. Okay, so we told Noah to only take two. Why? Because those particular beasts were not consumed for food. Okay. Let's go to 
Let's go to Genesis chapter 9, uh, verse. As a matter of fact, we'll come back to this. Genesis, the ninth chapter. We'll come back to this later. Okay? Let's go to Leviticus, the 11th chapter. We're in Leviticus, the 11th chapter. Now we're reading what we know as the dietary law. Okay? This law constitutes the, uh, the animals that were clean for human consumption or, or for man's consumption and the animals that were unclean, that were not to be used for man's consumption. Okay? Same thing with the fish, the fishes of the sea, the sea creatures. You had sea creatures that were clean for man's consumption, and you had sea creatures that were unclean for man's consumption, that were used as what you call bottom feeders. Okay? And also, last but not least, you had insects, which were also clean for man's consumption. And you had insects that were unclean for man's consumption. Okay? So we're going to try to breeze through it since we have limited time before we switch over so that we can get into the New Testament. And if we're not able to, um, to finish it up today, uh, whenever we are able to uh, uh, do the Sabbath class again, we will pick up on this particular topic, okay? Because it's very important that you all understand that when the New Testament speaks, uh, when it speaks about certain things about not judging people in meat, or when it speaks about uh, like Romans the 14th chapter, which we, which we will touch on later, when it speaks about uh, one that think if he may eat of all things, is not talking about all things under the sun, including unclean, unclean animals, okay? Those scriptures cannot be used to justify the eating of unclean creatures, okay? We're going to prove it. So we're in Leviticus, the 11th chapter, which constitutes what we call the dietary law of the Israelites. Go ahead. Leviticus 11 and 1. And the Most High spake unto Moses and to Aaron, saying unto them, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, These are the beasts which ye shall eat among all the beasts that are on the earth. So the Most High commanded, or the Most High spoke unto Moses and unto Aaron, and commanded them to tell unto the children of Israel. Now notice that this commandment was only given to the nation of Israel. Okay? So it's no marvel that the other nations who are set up over the earth do not follow this particular custom that we're about to read when it comes to uh, diet and what's okay for people's consumption or man's consumption. Okay? So we can't look to the Japanese or the Chinese to find out what uh, we can or cannot eat. Uh, we cannot look to the Europeans to figure out what we can and cannot eat. We cannot look to the Hermetic tribes, the Africans, to figure out what's okay for human consumption or people's consumption. We cannot look to the Arabs to figure out what's okay for the consumption of people. Okay? Even though they claim you can't eat pork, which is true, they still consume other animals and other creatures that are unclean. Okay? We can't look to our people in this day, of time, day and time because we have been uh, those who are, when I say our people, I'm talking about the pastors and the preachers that are set up. We can't look to them to figure out what's okay to eat and what not, what's not okay to eat because they've been taught by the same Gentiles who did not receive the dietary law. Okay? So we must go back to the Bible to figure out what's okay for our consumption. What's okay for us to eat and what's not okay for us to eat. Okay? Go ahead. Verse 3. Whatsoever part of the hoof and is cloven footed, and chew of the cud among the beasts, that shall ye eat. So whatsoever is cloven footed or depart or whatsoever part of the hoof is okay for our consumption. An example of an animal who is cloven footed is the goat. Okay, the goat. Also the lamb is cloven footed. An example of an animal that part of the hoof is the cow. Okay. Also the oxen, they have parted hoofs. Okay, go ahead. Verse 4. 
Nevertheless, these shall ye not eat. Of them that cheweth the cud, or of them that divideth the hoof. So here's a list of animals that though they may have a divided hoof, or they may chew the cud, these animals are still not okay for our consumption. Okay? Like what? Go ahead. As the camel. As the camel. Okay? Even though the camel has a divided, uh, the, the hoof is somewhat divided, it's not fully divided, uh, we cannot eat the camel. Okay? And you have, like I was mentioning earlier, you have the Arabs, the Ishmaelites, who say not to eat pork, but they consume camel. Okay? The camel is unclean for our consumption. Okay? And I believe that the camel chews the cud, but his, his hoof is not fully divided, so he's unclean. Okay, go ahead. As the camel, because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof. So he chews the cud, but he divideth not the hoof. When you look at a camel's hoof, it looks slightly divided, but it's not fully divided, like that of a cow or that of an ox. So he chews the cud, he regurgitates his food, and he digests it uh, through... Uh, I forget how many stomachs a, a camel has, but it has many different stomachs in which it digests uh, its food. Okay, that's what it means when it says it chew up the cut. Okay, but it's still not unclean for our consumption. Go ahead. He is unclean unto you. Verse 5. And a coney, because he chew up the cut, but divideth not the hoof. The coney, that's a form of rabbit. Okay, you have conies, like you have people who eat coney dogs. Okay. Made of rabbit. You can't eat the coney. Okay. Why? Because it, even though it chews the cud, it regurgitates its food and digests it in a certain manner, it divides not the hoof. Okay. Go ahead. He is unclean unto you. And he is unclean. Go ahead. Verse 6. And the hare, because he chew of the cud, but. The hare also a rabbit. Go ahead. Because he chew of the cud, but divideth not the hoof, he is unclean unto you. Verse 7, and the swine, though he divideth the hoof and, cloven, and be cloven footed, yet he cheweth not the cud. So it says the swine, even though he divideth the hoof and be cloven footed, it said he chews not the cud. Okay, he chews not the cud. Number one, the uh, pigs are not known for uh, strictly eating vegetation. Okay, and they do not eat the cud. They don't regurgitate their food and digest it in a manner which is clean. Okay, and on top of that, they eat uh, anything you put in front of them. Okay, as a matter of fact, one of the uh, tactics that was used to hide bodies uh, by the mafia, they probably still use this day, I'm not sure if they still use it this day. What they do is they'll cut up a body, they'll grind it up, and they'll feed it to the pig so that the body can never be found. Okay, and the pig, the pig doesn't decipher whether that food is, uh, whether it's vegetation, whether it's clean or unclean. They just eat it. They eat anything that's put in front of them. Okay, and that's what the Most High created them for, to eat the waste of the earth. Okay, not necessarily a dead body. A dead body is supposed to be buried, but, excuse me, this uh, the camera keeps refocusing. But the pig was, was created in order to eat uh, the waste of the earth. Okay? Read on. He is unclean unto you. Now keep this in mind when we speak about the unclean animals. Keep this in mind that these animals were not created for the consumption of people. Go ahead. Verse 8. Of their flesh shall ye not eat, and their carcasses shall ye not touch. They are unclean to you. So it says that the carcass of the swine was so filthy that you were not able to touch it. You were not allowed to touch a dead pig. Keep that in mind as we go on to the New Testament. Go ahead. Verse 9. These shall ye eat of all that are in the waters. Uh, whatsoever have fins and scales in the waters, in the seas, and in the rivers, them shall ye eat. So with whatsoever in the water have scales and fins were created for the consumption of people. People were allowed to consume these particular sea creatures. 
Go ahead. Verse 10. And all that have not fins nor scales in the seas and in the rivers of all that move in the waters and of any living thing which is in the waters, they shall be an abomination unto you. So any sea creature that has not scale of fins is unclean for our consumption. Okay. Some examples of clean sea creatures are sea bass, uh, sea bream, uh, tilapia. Uh, those animals or those sea creatures, excuse me, which have both scales and fins. Okay. Now it's going to give you some examples of sea creatures that are unclean for our consumption. Go ahead. Verse 11. There shall be even an abomination unto you. And they shall be abominations. Now once again, keep in mind that these creatures, which the Most High deemed unclean, were considered abominations. They were not to be touched. They were not to be cooked. They were not to be eaten. Okay, go ahead. You shall not eat of their flesh. You shall not eat of their flesh. Keep that in mind. Go ahead. But you shall have their carcasses in abomination. But their carcasses, which means their dead bodies, shall be an abomination. Now, some examples of unclean sea creatures are squid, octopus, shrimp, crab, lobsters, clams, oysters. Okay. Catfish. I know a lot of our people like catfish, but... Catfish is a very, very filthy sea creature. Okay? They're what you call bottom feeders. They like the they're like swine of the sea and all those creatures that you that are not uh okay for our consumption are like the, the pigs of the sea. Okay, they eat anything. They eat anything that's uh a waste product. They eat toxins. Okay, and that's that was created for the purpose of keeping the sea clean. So it's no marvel that now because people now consume the same creatures that were created to clean the earth, because we now eat these creatures, now the waters are polluted. They're filthy. Same thing with the land. Because people are eating swine at an all-time high, the waste of the earth is building up. you got landfills full of trash and disease and filth. Okay? When you're supposed to let the swine loose to go and uh, eat, the waste of the earth. Go ahead. Verse 12. Whosoever have no fins nor scales in the waters, they shall be an abomination unto you. So if he don't have scales or fins, then he's unclean. Okay, go ahead. Verse 13. These are they which ye shall eat, which ye shall have an abomination among fowls. So now it's going to go into the fowls, the birds. Go ahead. They shall not, they shall not be eaten. They are an abomination. The eagle. The eagle, unclean for consumption, for our consumption. Go ahead. And the ossifrich. The ossifrich. Go ahead. And the osprey. The osprey. I believe these are different forms of the ostrich. Okay. These are unclean for our consumption. Go ahead. Verse 14. And the vulture. The vulture. We know the vulture is known as a predator which eats... Uh, other animals uh, or other creatures okay and usually you can tell which animals are clean or unclean uh, by what they eat okay usually if an animal if a beast of the field or if a fish of the sea eats another creature another living creature then they're usually deemed unclean okay go ahead and the kite after his kind and the kite go ahead verse 15 every raven after his kind Every what? Every raven at the his kind. Every raven, another bird of prey. Go ahead. Verse 16, and the owl. And the owl, another bird of prey. Go ahead. And the nighthawk. And a cuckoo. And the hawk after his kind. And the hawk, another bird of prey. Go ahead. Verse 17, and the little owl. And the cor cormorant. Cormorant. And the cormorant and the great owl. Verse 18, and the swine, swine, and the pelican, and the gare eagle. So the swan, the pelican, and the gare eagle are all considered unclean. Go ahead. Verse 19, and the stork, and the heron, after his kind, and the lapwin, and the uh, bat. Verse 20, all fowls that creep, going up all 
on all four shall be an abomination unto you. Yet these may ye eat on every uh, flying, creeping thing that go that goeth upon all four. Read that again. Verse 21. Yet these may ye eat of every flying, creeping thing that goeth upon all four. So now this is going into the creeping things, the bugs. Go ahead. Which have legs uh, above their feet uh, to leap with all upon the earth. Go ahead. Verse 22. Even these of them ye may eat, the locust after his kind, and the bald locust after his kind, and the beetle after his kind. What verse are you at? Verse 22. Go ahead. And the grasshopper after his kind. Verse 23. For all other flying creeping things which have four, which have four feet shall be an abomination unto you. Verse 24. Let's jump back up to verse uh, 20. Verse 20. All fowls that creep, going upon all four, shall be an abomination unto you. Now, some people may have questions based on Leviticus 11 and 20, when it states, all fowls that go upon all four. Some people may ask, what birds or what fowls walk on all fours or have four legs? But when you go into the Hebrew, okay, the Hebrew word, the same Hebrew word that's uh, used for fowls of the air or birds which is ip okay the same hebrew word that's used to describe birds is the same hebrew word which is used to describe flying things or what whatsoever flieth that's what it says when it goes into the hebrew so verse 20 is not talking about birds it's talking about creeping things bugs which go upon all fours so you have to go into the hebrew word for fowl at verse 20 to realize that the same Hebrew word that's used to define birds is the same Hebrew word that's used to describe anything that flieth, like bugs or creeping things. Okay, just to clear that up. Go ahead. Verse 21. Yet these may ye eat of every flying creeping thing that goeth upon all four. 